Hey students, Christopher Hopper here, creator and co-author of Ruins of the Galaxy and lots of other great books. I get the privilege to talk to you today during this really strange season of coronavirus and this whole self-distancing and quarantining thing that's in effect. Uh, it can be awkward and so I feel really honored to be able to use technology to talk to you about our shared passion of writing. And I've been asked by your wonderful teacher to cover something that is near and dear to every writer that I know, and that is, how do you write a compelling plot? And this is a really detailed question, uh, one that gets asked a lot, and I've actually created a little handout for you today, too. So uh, you can download that at ChristopherHopper.com. Uh, hopefully your teacher has printed it out for you as well. So it's gonna be our guide for today. First of all, it's really important to decide what genre are you writing in? What style, what voice? Uh, how you approach your story is gonna be different for every genre. So for instance, if you have a mystery novel, you're going to keep information back from your reader from the very beginning and hope they discover what your main protagonist is discovering as they go. Whereas if you have a thriller or suspense novel, you're actually gonna release a lot of information up front and let your reader in on the secret, but keep your protagonist in the dark. So there are lots of differences in how you can go about writing according to your genre. Today, however, we're gonna assume that you have that figured out, that you know what kind of story you wanna write, but we're gonna talk about what I call the three-layer matrix. And this is three levels of construction that you can use and the cool thing about this is you don't have to know all three. You can just pick one that resonates with you right off the bat. However, when I am writing a story for Ruins of the Galaxy or any of the other universes that I have the privilege to write in, these three layers are kind of in my head at the same time, and I'm picking and choosing as I go, but they kind of form this, this bedrock foundation that guides me as I move forward. So let's jump into the handout. The first page that you're gonna see has a big number one up on the upper left-hand side, and it says standard plot arc, the four-act play. Now, this is the very first layer, and you've probably seen this before. You can find it on the internet. Uh, your teacher has probably gone over it, and it really is the basic best guide for how do you write a four-act play, uh, movie, story, whatever it is that you're going for. Movies do tend to act in three different scenes, but that's kind of a different thing altogether. We're talking about writing books or short stories. So the very first thing you'll see is this one down here, the, the exposition, which is the setting, characters, and background. It's essentially the setup. We're gonna talk about that more in layer two. The second thing that happens is the initial incident. And this is the first main conflict point that your protagonists get involved with. This is the bang that happens in the story. The next part is the rising action which is, I say, up to three major events that add suspense or tension to the plot. And these are just the fun things that happen. This is how you really, you really get to first start messing with your protagonist. And as an author and a writer, that's a lot of fun to do, even though it's somewhat sadistic. Uh, at the top, you have the climax, which is the most suspenseful uh, part of the plot. It's also the turning point for the protagonist, and this is where the whole story kind of pivots and starts leaning toward the end resolution. We have the falling action, which are events that deconstruct or answer the conflict between the protagonist and the antagonist. You have the resolution, which is the conflict uh, being resolved, and we discover whether or not the protagonist was successful in his or her goals. And by the way, I like that or not, because not every story has to have a, a happy ending. There can be tragedies and life is full of them. And so sometimes your stories help relate uh, people to the issues in their lives that aren't great and they can find catharsis in that. So uh, I challenge you with picking up some things that maybe aren't as happy and yet you still have a way of addressing situations in a hopeful way. Uh, the final part is the denouement, which is the tying up of loose ends. It comes from the French word denouer, which is to undo a knot. So we're kind of taking this big jumble of, of mess of strings and wires and we're laying it all out to smooth it out to bring a sense of, again, catharsis to the reader. So that's the first layer of the matrix. And the second, and I just like Matrix because it's a great movie. The second layer of my Matrix is what I call the four story components. And this is based on work you'll see up here by the great Larry Brooks. And you can pick up many of his books. This comes from his book, Demystifying Story. And uh, this is broken into four parts, which if you'll notice, 
kind of correlate to the first set. So they're meant to layer on each other. That's the three story matrix. Uh, part one, this is uh, what he calls and what I've kind of termed in my own vernacular, um, the setup which is where we learn what the stakes are, what's at stake for the protagonist. And then the third component where the, the protagonist acts like an orphan. And in other words, they're lost, they don't have parentage, there's no sense of oversight. And this doesn't necessarily mean genetically, but it means in terms of the character's attitude and how they feel in the world that they live in. The second part, which again follows this whole rising uh, toward the climax, rising action, is part two. And this is the midpoint, uh, or leading into the midpoint. And it's also the main character's response. And then you'll see the main character is acting kind of like a wanderer here. Uh, this is where the character is, you could say if it was a thriller, they're being chased by the enemy, but they don't know who the enemy is yet. Um, if it's a romance, they love this person, but it's maybe unrequited love, so the other party doesn't really know about it, uh, but it's a really great um, section for building suspense. Uh, these first two, by the way, this is not exactly accurate with, with terms of distance and measurement, but these tend to take up the bulk of the story. In fact, I would say these probably take up anywhere from, from half to maybe over half of the story. Then we jump into part three, and you'll see up there it says it's the attack or where the main protagonist becomes the warrior. And so they've, they've, they've been the orphan, they've been wandering, they've gotten information, and now they're in a place to actually uh, refute the enemy, attack the enemy, um, if, if the enemy is you know, some sort of environmental thing. It could be, how are they weathering the storm? Uh, if it's, um, again, in a romance, maybe another suitor that they are trying to bypass. But Whatever it is, they are in a position now to actually uh, go on the offensive in their world. The last part, part four, is the resolution, and it's where the main character becomes the martyr. Now, this does not mean that your protagonist has to die. It simply means that they are giving up something of themselves in order to bring the story to a conclusion. So this is the second part of my three-layer matrix that, again, is kind of just floating around in my head as I'm putting together my outline. The third part, which you'll see on your third sheet, is called The Hero's Journey. Now, this is what I would consider the most optional of the three layers because it is actually much more of a model to follow than it necessarily is a universal layer. Now, I will say it is universal in another way in that this comes from the late Joseph Campbell, who is arguably one of the great voices and grandfathers of modern storytelling. And he actually developed his concept of what the hero's journey is by anthropo anthropological wow research of humanity and how we have told stories throughout the ages. And so while not every story follows this approach, uh, it certainly, again, works really well for layering in my little matrix here and showing you uh, a very universal type of storytelling that you will immediately recognize because this is the basis for every Pixar movie that you've ever seen. This is the basis for every Star Wars movie that you've ever seen. Those writers uh, have followed Joseph Campbell's direction. And so this is something that you'll resonate with and you'll probably go, oh yeah, as we move through it. So let's go quickly. The first section you'll see right here says normal world because this is where the character uh, finds themselves in their normal world. Now, it might not be normal for other people in their world. It might not be normal for you, but for them, it is. So I think of the movie Cars with Lightning McQueen. He's this rookie all-star, right? Now, to everybody else, they're not a rookie all-star. I'm not a rookie all-star, but Lightning McQueen is. So to him, this is his normal world. The very first thing we see then is point one, Roman numeral one is the call to adventure for Lightning McQueen. This is actually where he gets thrust out of the back of Mac. He's in the Mac truck and he's thrown out in the middle of the night. Uh, sometimes the call is arbitrary, sometimes the call is intentional, sometimes the call is an accident or an emergency, but in whatever case, uh, this is the call into adventure and where we start heading 
this way into the unknown, which is foreign and often dangerous territory. Uh, in this journey, we have the second point, which is meeting the mentor. And this can be people that are older, wiser sages. This can be people that have skills that the main protagonist is going to need in their adventure. Uh, this is crossing the threshold, number three, where they actually enter into now this new unknown territory. Uh, point four are tests, allies, and enemies. And again, this is where the main protagonist is meeting and bumping up against things that are challenging him or her and really causing them and provoking them to go, wow, this is, this is a, a brave new world, so to, so to speak. Uh, point five are uh, growth and new skills where they might be, again, learning from their mentors and they're just kind of growing in life, figuring out what things are going on. Again, Lightning McQueen, this is him learning how to drift with Doc through the dirt track. We finally get to this place, and this is uh, the very climax, again, going back to uh, layer number one. Here's the climax, which is the ordeal, uh, which deals with the death and rebirth of the main character. Again, not saying they physically have to die and have a resurrection. Uh, depending upon what genre you're writing in, what kind of story you're trying to tell, this could be an emotional death and a resurrection. This could be um, something in which uh, their organization or their government falls apart or fails them in some way. A value system is deconstructed. My personal favorite part right here is number seven, which is the cave and the revelation. This is that part in every movie that you've seen that follows this model where the main character uh, finds himself alone. They could be washed up. I'm thinking of the, the movie Arthur Christmas, where, where Arthur is washed up on this beach after the sleigh malfunctions, the navigation goes awry, and he and his team are jettisoned. And he's just, he's sitting there on this beach contemplating what the real meaning of Christmas is. Uh, but whatever it is, this main character is in a very, typically a dark place, very pensive, and they're processing everything they've been through, trying to figure out what is the meaning of life. That's the cave, that's number seven. Out of the cave, they come into a place of atonement and victory, uh, which is point eight. That's where they go back and they confront their nemesis. They confront uh, the, the arch enemy in their world. Again, doesn't have to be a person. It could be a sailor on the ocean battling a tempest for the tenth time. But the eleventh time, man, this is the time that they're gonna. They're actually gonna break through the storm. Uh, the point number ten is what we call seizing the treasure. Uh, this is where they come into that place of whether it be deep understanding, whether it be riches, whether it be a relationship, no matter what it is, but they're actually getting that thing that they've been seeking either by accident or intentionally from the very beginning. And then the very last point, which is point 11, uh, the return home changed. The main character comes home changed. And you'll notice they've entered back into their normal world, but we call it now a new normal. This is the protagonist's return to a new version of their once ordinary life, but knowing it will never be the same. This is Frodo Baggins coming back into the Shire after he's gone through Middle Earth into Mordor and thrown the ring into the volcano. He knows that the Shire will never be what it once was to him. And this can both be a very, um, again, cathartic moment. It can be nostalgic. It can even be, uh, you know, reflective and even a bit sad because there's a loss of innocence, so to speak. It doesn't always have to be negative, um, but this is, again, the point where you're trying to wrap things up in the story. So anyway, I hope that helps. I hope it gets the wheels turning for you as you look to start to plot out your story. Again, thinking about layer number one, layer number two, <laughs> layer number three, and hopefully these are things that you can refer back to uh, both now and in the future. Again, these are tools that I use every day when I'm writing my stories, and especially when I'm breaking my plot out. In fact, I will take Joseph Campbell's, excuse me, no, I will take Larry Brooks's um, uh, parts, four parts, and I'll lay out my stories under those headings just to make sure that all of the, the main plot points are lining up where they need to and that I have an overall feel and scope of the, the narrative. So anyway, hope that helps and uh, thank you so much for watching. 
Hope you guys have a great rest of this season, even though I know it's uncertain. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to leave them uh, in the comments below this video or in the comments on my blog at ChristopherHopper.com. Thanks for watching and best of luck to you in your writing. I hope that you have a wonderful time uh, investigating and journeying through the worlds that you come up with with your imagination. Have a great day.